The following content has been provided by RWTH Aachen University. So that, those were all the evaluation techniques that we have available without users. Um, now, if we want to evaluate with users, uh, we need to think about what kind of result do we want. Do we want a precise sort of you know, numerical result? Pi menus are 3.5% faster than linear menus in the following situations. Or do we want to really more understand what kind of mistakes are people making with our interface? What kind of problems do we have? Most of the times in practical applications and in industry, you're really interested more in this part and not so much in this. Um, but in, in, you know, in academia, when we're really trying to decide whether a new interaction technique is better than the old one, we often need more of those kinds of results. So E1 and E4 evaluate without the user, the ones that we've seen so far. Um, and as soon as we get into prototypes that we can test with users, we should also be testing with them uh, using the methods that follow now. Now, let me assume I have this, this prototype, OK? What is the simplest way I could test this with a user? What would you do? Give it to him. Yep. And then look at him. Yeah. Give it to him and then take a hard look, see what happens, right? That's pretty much model extraction. What that means is I take the interface, um, show, show it to you as a user, the prototype, screenshots, whatever, and then I basically ask you um, to explain the interface to me. So I'm like, okay, so what do you think this is? What do you think this button does? And what do you think this button does? So basically we, we step through um, and extract the model from the user, um, meaning that I try to understand what the naive user's conceptual model is when he first sees the system, okay? That can immediately tell you if there's a button on there that says program and the user says, oh, I'm sure that's to program to, ch to change the TV program. And you're like, oh, crap. You know, I wanted it to mean something else. Uh, I guess I picked the wrong word there. We've already found a problem, right? Very easy um, approach. The problem, of course, is um, this is not going to tell you what happens when the user starts interacting with it because I'm just giving it to you and you ask you to explain basically the start screen to me, right? Um, so if you want to see, you know, this basically tells me, do you get the interface? Do you get what's where? But if I want to see how you do with a task, what's the next step? What would I have to do if I wanted to see what, how the user handles a whole task with this? Fairly easy. I would say to him what he should do and what should try to do it. Exactly. I tell him what to do. So I said, this is silent observation. Um, I tell the designer, um, here's the device and here's the task. I want you to, I, want you to, I don't know, um, turn the TV on and switch to, I don't know, MTV. Um, and then I watch the user do this task, but I don't interfere. That's why it's called silent observation. The user is not talking. That's why it's called silent observation. I'm not talking anyway. Whenever this is going on, I'm just observing. Right? Any of those things, I don't really, during the task, I don't talk back to the user because that's going to be uh, interfering with the results. So this helps you to discover big problems, definitely. If there is something that the user gets stuck in, uh, then you can see that it's not working. But there's one problem. We don't know why they get stuck, because they are not allowed to talk. They're just supposed to operate it and do the thing. So we don't hear what's going on. We can't really understand why somebody's running into a particular issue. And since you can't look into their brain, you can just observe from the outside. You don't really understand the decision process behind uh, why he keeps pressing you know, the program button. You're like, but I don't want you to program the remote. And um, uh, so <coughs> we have an issue understanding why, why certain mistakes are being made. How do we address that? 
Let them, let them speak out loud. Let them speak out loud. That's think aloud, exactly. That's the version E7. By the way, these pictures are coming from uh, Saul Greenberg here, um, excellent researcher in HCI. Um, so E7, think aloud, is one of the most frequently used techniques in industry today. Uh, basically, like what we just said, um, as E6, we, I think we need to change that number here. Um, but the user is asked to change, uh, to say aloud what she thinks is happening, what she thinks, what she's trying to achieve, and what, why she's doing something specific. So basically, you know, the current state of the interface, her goals, and the actions that she's she's trying to do. Um, so here's the user sitting in front of this computer, trying to do a particular task, saying, "Hmm, what does this do? I'll try it. Oops. Uh, now what happened?" And meanwhile, the uh, observer you, for example, as a designer, are watching her do this and trying to understand what's going on. Most common method in industry today, like I said, um, it gets you to understand what the conceptual model is that the user is developing in their head. Why mistakes happen, why something works well. So this is good to get some insight into the user's thinking, but talking while you are focused on a task is not that easy, talking about things. It, changes the way you do the task because you are talking about it while you do it. So that's a little weird. Um, and also, it's kind of strange to be talking to yourself. Normally, it's kind of like the crazy person that gets on the bus and sits next to you and then starts talking to themselves. That's what you're supposed to be doing here, right? So it's a little, it's a little strange. Um, how could we change that? Yeah? Maybe let the person do it first and then ask why uh, he did it or... Yeah, that's a good idea. So first have people just do what they're supposed to be doing and then ask them later why they did certain things. Um, an excellent way to do that is to tape them while they're doing it and then go over the tapes together. Right? That's a wonderful way to capture that. It's called retrospective testing. We'll talk about that later. Um, there's one other way to get out of this catch of it being weird to sit there and sort of talk to yourself. Yep. Uh, you could have two users and one gives instructions to the other based on uh, what he thinks. Exactly. So you basically get two people, and that's constructive interaction. So we now have one person here, the slightly Neanderthal-looking person, um, who's like, oh, why did it do that? And then the person who maybe already knows the system a little uh, says, oh, I think you clicked on the wrong icon. So we've done two things here. We've introduced a second person as a second user, and, and we don't have to do that, but we can. We also made these two users of different knowledge levels. One is maybe a total newbie, and the other has seen the system a little bit. Okay, that's possible. You don't have to do that, but you can. Um, and you, even if they're both total newbies, you can observe them as they try to do the task together. And now it's perfectly normal because, you know, here we are two, I'm the observer, you guys are the users, and you talk to each other and they're like, okay, so why do I need to press up? What do you think this button is? And I just observe your discussion. Right? So it's easy to talk aloud when you're talking to somebody else. It's less weird. You're no longer the crazy person on the bus. Um, and then, of course, capturing this, recording this whenever possible. And the variant of that is to use two partners who are different skill levels, right? One semi-expert is a trainer, like you just described back there, um, and then the newbie as the student. Student sort of uses the user interface and asks the, the trainer, why do you think this is going on, or I'm having this problem? And the, the trainer, the, the, the semi-expert, um, helps the, the newcomer. This is wonderful because it gives you insight into the mental model, both of a total beginner who's never seen the system and of somebody who's already used it. And I can tell you, you will be very surprised of some of the conceptual models that emerge in users' heads about your software. Right? You will see people saying like, um, you know, the newbie is saying, okay, so now I want to print, and then the semi-expert says, uh, if you want to print, you first need to click that button over there three times. I don't know exactly why, but it works really better when you do that. And once I didn't do it, and then the system crashed. So I always click that button three times, and you're like, what? Um, so all these like false causalities, these like weird mental models that you weren't expecting get exposed that way because you see what people do 
think of your system once they've used it for a little while. So that's a wonderful way of um, verifying sort of how the mental model um, develops over time. Okay, so next time we will talk about how to capture this kind of stuff and what to do after the testing. Um, for now, I want to thank you again for listening and see you again next week. This content was provided by RWTH, Aachen University.